It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Persky as our seminar speaker today, hosted by both our bioenergetics and behavioral medicine sig here in the CTR. Dr. Persky is an associate investigator and the director of the Immersive Virtual Environment Testing Unit, then the Social Behavioral Research Branch up at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Those aren't things we'd normally put together. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like the epitome of translational medicine which is what we do here in the Center for Translational Research. She earned her BA in Psychology at Northwestern University, came to the NIH in 2005 after completing her postdoctoral research at Columbia, and then there she built the immersive VR-based experimental research lab within the SCRB in 2006. And when she came with a backpack, I was hoping we'd have some yeah, VR glasses. She does not have the show on the road yet. We have to go there to experience it, but the slides will give us a taste of it. Just talking to her gave us a taste of it before this hour. Um, her research investigates how genomic knowledge about common health conditions, like obesity and diabetes, so the conditions that don't have even single gene concepts are hard to convey, but that don't have single gene concepts, how that metadata can be translated and affect healthcare more positively for both providers and patients in uh, public and online discourse. She subjects extensively in this area, the area of health communication, um, genomics and virtual reality methods going bravely, where a few have gone before, and helping us navigate this new digital reality that is changing medical practice for better or worse, and we want to learn from her how to use it for the better. She'll talk to us today about the use of virtual reality in genomic medicine, and that topic intrigues anyone else as much as it does me. I think we're in for a really interesting talk. Thank you so much, Susan, for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much just for coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've had really fantastic conversations already this morning. Um, try not to spoil too much, but um, but you know I, I'm already seeing so many connections that it's been. Um, so I look forward to many more of these. Um, I am coming to you from across town over at NIH, um, and I didn't bring any with me because most of the uh, VR that we use is actually sort of tethered to a computer, a pretty robust computer. But I give you an open invitation to send me an email and plan for a visit um, over at NIH. I'd be really happy to show you all these things in person. So consider that your invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about sort of where we're coming from in genomics and common health conditions. This is probably things that most of you are aware of, but just to get us all on the same page here, um, it is very uncommon, as, as we're all kind of aware, to use genomics for common health conditions like obesity, like type 2 diabetes, like heart disease, you know, in clinic or for any sort of treatment purposes. However, um, the Domain of genomic translation, considered sort of broadly, is huge. It's vast. It's, you know, it's companies coming out all the time. It's in the public eye. It's, in, it's starting to be in clinic. There's a huge research effort going on in this area, and it moves fast. And it moves a lot faster than a lot of the treatments and a lot of things we're sort of used to seeing. And you've probably heard about the 17-year pipeline to get something from research into you know, drug translation. I mean, genomics research finally comes out, and some companies like let's do that. Okay. So basically, you know, we have 23andMe, who was for a while not giving um, health risk information for common health conditions. They're back to giving uh, polygenic risk scores for obesity, for type 2 diabetes, and so on. And then, we, of course, we have many companies who are happy to, to take your money, <laughs> take your DNA, and teach you how to live your code, right? These things are popping up every single day. And so I will argue that it's important for us to sort of stop now, even before we're thinking about really using genomics for common disease clinically, to start to think about how we might optimize communication of some of these concepts to patients, to providers, to the public. Um, for many reasons, just a few of them up here are to encourage healthy behavior among individuals, to aid in good medical decision making, and also to address some of the blame and stigma that are associated with health conditions, because this could be a really nice kind of side effect of thinking about and talking about genetics and genomics. But even if we never, ever end up using genetics for common health conditions in clinic, it will still be really important to think about how to communicate these issues. Um, and that's because it's, it's everywhere, right? In the media, every time there's a discovery around genomics, you get 
very quality of news articles, just talking about how that might affect you, know, you person from the public. So what is even learning about this kind of stuff doing uh, to, you know, for public health purposes to individuals? So this is kind of the world where I'm coming from in thinking about how should we be talking about these things? What's the best way to teach these concepts? How much do people actually need to know? You know, what's optimal? So to do a lot of this research, I use virtual reality, and I'm coming from the immersive virtual environment testing area. Um, we are a research facility in the NIH Clinical Center where um, it's basically a research core where we apply emerging technology, mostly virtual reality technology, but you know, we dabble in other areas too, to address questions at the intersection of genomics and society and sort of genomics translation. So all, all of the work I'll be talking about today I think for the most part it's pretty much work that I do, my substantive research, but I also um, chair this core here where I can help other people realize uh, technology in their research at NIH. Okay, so now that you've gotten that preamble, probably the thing you should be asking yourself is why on earth would she do this? What does virtual reality have to do with genomics? Uh, is it just because it's a you know, cool new emerging tech? I'm going to say the answer is no, but that's not true for every researcher out there, so it's good to have a little bit of um, healthy skepticism. So why do I do this? What, so what are the practical and the psychological features of virtual reality that make it a good fit for answering questions about genomics? So I'm going to walk through several of these, but I'll, I'm not going to give great examples for most of them right now, but hopefully you'll see them unfold as I talk about the specific research that we've been doing in this area. So the really big one is immersion and presence. Okay, so you put on a virtual reality helmet, and you are immersed in the content, the digital content that's being presented to you. You can't check your phone, right? You can't do anything else. You are sort of a prisoner, for better or for worse, right? But this also allows for the sense of presence. So when you're in virtual reality, this is a psychological concept that most of the time you are present in the digital virtual reality that's happening there, not in the physical room where you're standing. So this is one where I will give an example. Has anybody ever done a virtual reality demo of a plane? where you're sort of high up, standing on a, a little plank above a building. Okay, a couple of people. This is a very, very powerful demonstration. If you come visit me at NIH, I will give you a demonstration of this, because it really helps. I, well, right, exactly. So, you know, imagine you're, you're kind of looking around you, and you look like you're, you know, 50 stories up in the air, and you hear a little bit of wind whistling, you know, in your ears, um, and then we say, go ahead and walk out on the plane. And probably, I would say less than 50% of the people are like, okay. Most people won't do it. Now they know they're in a room just like this. The floor is solid. They are not going to fall. We are out there ready to spot them. I mean, you know this, right? Cognitively, there is no risk. But people won't do it. If people will do it, then we say, okay, go ahead and step off and like. <laughs> Maybe 10% of the people who come into the lab will do that. Okay, and if you do, it does, you know, it does make you feel like you're falling, you know, it does that whole simulation. Um, but you're safe, right? You're in a room on a floor. So this really sort of underscores the psychological power of virtual reality. Uh, you know, this is how our brains are made. Our brains are made to be able to be tricked by these kinds of stimuli into feeling like something is real. And so that um, underscores the next piece here, which is psychological reality. So there's a large body of research going back several years showing that the responses, both psychological and behavioral, that people have in VR situations are often the same as or very similar to the responses that we see in real life. Um, this is one of the things that allows us to use it for research in a way that is, you know, compelling and we know that we can take our findings and, and um, generalize that to real life settings. At the same time, we have control. So in real life settings, things are messy. Right? If you want to study things in a doctor-patient interaction, you know, people are coming in for different reasons. Maybe they bring a family member. Maybe they don't. Maybe they're running late. You know, there's all these things that kind of go on in the real world that make things a little bit messier than I, as an experimental social psychologist, would love to have in my lab. So in VR, we program everything. Everything is the same every single time because we make it that way. At the same time, we have flexibility. So uh, we were just talking about this a little earlier. We can do anything. If I want to be standing next to a 17-foot tall purple dragon breathing ice cream, I can do that. Why not, right? So there are you know, endless possibilities of what we can actually have people sort of experience and do and look at in VR. 
Um, and what that allows us to do from a research perspective, we don't use dragons. We, we do sort of stimuli that would be difficult or impossible to present in real lab settings. We also get really great measurement opportunities. The way the system works is we have to know where people are looking around in the room because we have to render the digital content that belongs in their, in their view. Um, so the system has to know where we are. The system has to know where our arms out are. So it can put you know, the virtual digital hands in the, um, in the scenario. So all we do is capture that data. We just take the data and then in some cases we have a very good idea of what it means. And I'll show you some of those in the research in just a little bit. And in other cases, we're trying to figure out if it's meaningful. But in any case, we get full loads of data. And then the perspective. So VR, in most cases, is first person, just like you when you were looking around out your eyes every day as you walk around. That's how VR is. So you can put somebody into the perspective of another person. This is often used for empathy development, uh, but there are a lot of ways that it can be used. And then finally, is portability. I am not demonstrating that today. But we can sort of pack things up and take them on the road. Uh, right now, it's sort of a carry-on Pelican-sized case, um, but you know, as it gets better, it gets more and more um, possible to kind of bring these experiences around with us, which is a really important thing in this era of replication crises and things like that. Okay, so now let's get into some of the substantive work. Okay, so in applying any technology to research, we of course start with the research. Right? We never start with the tech. We always say, what is it that we actually want to do? What do we want to show? So part of the research that I do relates to healthcare communication. And one of the research questions that I ask in this area is what variables influence the use of and the response to genomic information? Um, here, I'll talk about work with obesity. We've looked at work in a couple of different areas, but information about obesity and genomics in a clinical setting. briefly this very complicated theoretical model that I use, mostly just to prove it's here, but um, basically what we're thinking about in doing this work is how presentation of genomic information or thinking about genomics can influence relationship outcomes between patients and physicians, so things like perceived stigma and trust, which can go on to relate to intermediate relationship outcomes, so things like adherence to treatment, which of course go on to influence health. And then through this bottom um, right here is how genomic information can influence health beliefs and attitudes of behavior, which of course also influence health. Um, one of the big things I do is study the moderator. So what things change the way that genetic information is uh, perceived, is used, is reacted to? And the big, oh, I don't have that last little piece, but the big reason for that is because the um, outcome of presenting genetic information on health or on some of these, these pathways can be positive or negative. So these are some of the things we talked about this morning. You talk about genetics and you think, okay, well, boy, I have to work harder. You know, maybe that other people might or then I realize it. Or you can say, well, hmm, maybe there's nothing I can do. Right? Both of these things are possible responses. They're probably a little bit more extreme than what we really see, but they're possible responses. And what makes the difference between whether you go one way or the other? Okay, and in the, in the same uh, relationship outcome, you can feel like, boy, I really feel like this doctor isn't stigmatizing me and I really trust this doctor because she mentioned, you know, genetics and I feel like that's true for me. Or you can feel like, oh, well, is this doctor saying that there's something fundamentally wrong with me, you know, that I'm not going to be able to change. So there's ways that we can have better outcomes or worse outcomes, so how do we get there? Okay, so this is an early study we did, but I still really love it, so I'm going to present it. This is the first study we did with VR. Um, in communicating about genomic information. And here our study sample was medical students. So we brought medical students into our lab, and some of them got information about genetic factors and obesity. Some of them didn't. Some of them got read about chronic daily headaches. And then some got sort of the standard behavioral information about obesity. Um, and then we had them interact with this patient who appeared to be either lean or have obesity. And we Oh, and here is our virtual uh, clinic. This is actually the virtual clinic we use for all of our work. Um, it's a 360 degree, you know, there's a floor, there's a ceiling, um, it's all sort of there. Um, this is our newer version where we have a patient record um, on an iPad. We used to have it on a big monitor screen. We tried to change with the times a little bit. Uh, but basically this is the context in which our medical students were interacting with this virtual patient. Okay, so we had them interact with 
patient, and then we did several things. We have several outcomes that we measured um, following and during the interaction. So the first thing we can look at is this sort of interpersonal interaction piece. So negative stereotyping of the patient. And as you would probably be unsurprised to see, for the control version, for the control uh, conditions where they didn't read about any causal attribution in obesity, um, they stereotype the obese version of the patient far more than the lean version of the patient. Getting the genetic information somewhat attenuated that negative stereotyping of the patient, um, sort of associated with less blame and so on. Interestingly, we also looked at visual contact with the patient, which is a proxy for eye contact, which we know is very important clinically. And we see something kind of similar. So we see less eye contact or visual contact with the patient when that patient appears to be obese versus lean um, and receiving the genetic information did uh, fully restore levels of eye contact. <clears throat> so that's kind of the interpersonal piece. And then we went ahead and we said, okay, well, what about sort of recommendations for this patient? I mean, we, we looked at this in a bunch of different ways. Here I'm showing you recommendations for health behavior follow-up. So we said sort of from a primary care standpoint, what kinds of things do you want to do with this patient? Um, you know, recommend to this patient at the end of the visit. And so we looked at a score that was kind of related to weight um, and related to health behavior. And for our um, control uh, participants who saw the obese version of the patient, and for those who got the behavioral information of the patient, we saw pretty high levels of recommendation for all of these things, but we saw lesser rates of recommendation for those who received the genetic information. So this is an area where, you know, there could be sort of a little bit of a double-edged sword to this thing. It could be good for interpersonal interaction. We might have to really think about how we're communicating when we think about what's going to happen, um, health recommendation or clinic wise. So that's with the provider side of the equation. So now we can look at some of the work we've done with the patient side of the equation. So now what happens when patients learn about genomics? So this is our virtual doctor that we use in a lot of our studies, Dr. Morrison. Um, all kinds of stories about how we got to this particular guy, but <laughs> this is him. Um, and I'll, just, I'll talk about a study where we looked at these sort of moderators I talked about. So if we're going to give uh, patients information about genetics um, or genomics and obesity, what will make the difference of how patients will interpret use that information? Uh, one of the really important moderators that we were thinking about was emotion. And this isn't necessarily like the provider makes you feel emotion, but people come into these visits feeling all kinds of emotions all the time. You know, so you might be angry, um, you know, maybe you feel like the, you know, the staff at the front desk were really rude to you. You know, there's all kinds of reasons you could come in angry. And you know, maybe you're afraid that you're going to get your blood drawn at the end of the visit. And there's all kinds of reasons you could be afraid. But these particular specific emotions psychologically are linked to all kinds of um, predispositions to, to different behaviors and different orientations. And so anger is an approach emotion, and it's associated with low risk perception. You know, if you're angry, you're likely to sort of do something and not really feel like you're at risk. Whereas fear is associated with high risk perception. So there's all kinds of things that, that make you think that people might interpret genetic information differently when they're in these particular emotional states. So I'll start with an online study that we did. We talked a little this morning about, you know, is it different to use virtual reality versus an online platform? Um, this is one area where we started to kind of look, about, look at that a little bit because we've done some of these studies with an online arm where people watch a video of the virtual provider as opposed to interacting you know, in 3D with our virtual provider. So in our online study, we were able to collect a lot of people, um, so on and so forth, and we looked at um, the sort of final takeaway is up there. Don't look at that yet. <laughs> <laughs> we looked at their um, health behavior motivation after receiving genetic information in these different states. And I should say the genomic information they're receiving is generalized. It's not like you have a 46% risk of something or you have this gene or that gene. It's sort of like, have you thought about you know, genetics? And you know, it's highly, there's high heritability, and this is sort of what genetics means, and genetics is destiny. That's kind of the, the nature of the message. So what we saw was that when our participants were in a fear state and receiving genetic information, they actually were less likely to have intentions to improve their diet and less likely to have intentions to improve their physical activity, which was kind of interesting to us. We are like, well, maybe they're feeling low risk perception, but that's not what you would expect um, in a fear state. But in fact, what we also saw was that our participants in a fear state, when we gave them genetic information, we didn't see increased genetic attribution. So we were giving them genetic information, and they weren't like, oh, yeah, genetics, that's interesting. Like, maybe that's a cause. They were just sort of like, eh, I don't know. 
So what this suggests is that they're potentially, we're seeing some defensive processing of genetic information. So maybe people, when they're afraid, when they're in this fear state, aren't really sort of ready to take in this information. And they're sort of pushing it away and avoiding it, which is interesting. We'll see this come up again. So then we ran the study again in VR with the emotions, but another thing that we had seen is, oh, another thing that we added on was patient race. So how would patient race interact with the, of the genetic information? And I think, oh, I do. Okay, so the, the context for this is that we had done a study um, just uh, a few years prior in the context of lung cancer where we gave genetic, genomic information to African-American patients on their risk of lung cancer and some other common cancers, and we varied the race of the provider, of the virtual reality provider, to be racially concordant or racially discordant um, with the patient. And what we found was that these particular patients were far more accurate in their risk perception. Afterwards, we said, okay, well, what is your risk of lung cancer? What do you think it is? They were far more accurate in their risk perceptions following genomic information delivery if they got that information from a racially concordant provider. And we think a lot of the reasons that have probably revolved around trust. Trust of the provider and trust of the genetic information that's being delivered. So this was the context in which we decided, well, why don't we look at that in this other study on obesity? We did the study, and here we're looking now more at the interpersonal behavior pieces of the interaction. Um, what we found was really interesting. We found that for our white participants on the right here, we saw pretty much we had what we had hypothesized. That those who got genomic information reported trusting the provider more. You know, the, the provider who was giving them genomic information. We actually saw the reverse um, in the black women in the study, which was really interesting. And we saw this on a few outcomes, not just trust. One of the other things we did is we looked at the interpersonal behavior between um, the, 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 well, the virtual provider didn't have any different behavior, but we looked at the interpersonal behavior of the participant. And this is a really complicated graph, but I'll walk you through it. Basically, what we're looking at here is the average distance that the patient, or the participant was away from the <coughs> virtual doctor, basically because they're leaning in towards the doctor when they're talking to him, or they're leaning away from him. And this is a marker of engagement and a marker of the sort of positive, negative feelings in the interaction. And there were two groups who looked really interesting to us, and those are those two where over time, which is the, um, the uh, x-axis there, started to kind of pull back from the provider as we start talking about genomics. And those were our black participants in the anger condition who got genetic information, and our white participants in the, in the behavioral condition who were also in the anger condition. And so we feel like this emotional state of anger was kind of enough to sort of push people to start to physically disengage from the interaction when they received the kind of information that they sort of liked less or that they were less response, that they were less sort of happy to get. So now we're starting to see actually sort of physical nonverbal behavior that's mirroring some of our self-report outcomes. So that, so we're, I'll sh I think I'll show you in a second where we are sort of in our research trajectory here. But basically what we're seeing right now is unfortunately what we see in a lot of this literature, which is it is complicated, right? And what we're seeing is that there are many moderators that are really influential on the use of and the response to genomic information provision. So, you know, there's going to be responses and there's going to be variables that will push people towards more negative responses to genomics versus more positive responses to genomics. Um, and so how do we sort of figure out what to do here? So one of the things that we decided to do was to target those moderator variables that we felt like, you know, had the most social impact, were the, the places where we felt like we wanted to start. So what we're doing right now, and this is where we're actually collecting data right this minute, um, is a study called, uh, we're looking at medical student response to polygenic risk scores. So I'll, I'll talk about the moderator in a second. But right now what seems to be happening is that people are walking into their provider's office with their 23andMe or their other, you know, their ancestry results and saying, you know, here, <laughs> right? And the providers are saying, like, we have no idea what to do with this. What should we do with this? And it's a case-by-case -case basis, right? They have to kind of make up their minds, what, what am I going to do with this? Um, and so we decided to go ahead and look at medical students and see how medical students were going to interpret these information. They're not really taught how to do it, but you know what? Neither are practicing providers, and there's a population where we would probably want to go in and try to, you know, talk to them about this. So we are um, bringing medical students, having them interact with a virtual patient where they're either getting information
information, not just carrier testing. Um, here's some carrier tests, and they're all negative and nothing to worry about here. Versus carrier testing plus polygenic risk scores for five different health conditions. Some of which she's at increased risk, some of which she's not. Um, but here's the catch, is that they're readily assigned to see a patient who is either black or is white. Um, and here we've used our model um, that we used in some of the, the obesity studies earlier. So she's a little bit, she's overweight, um, her weight will differ. And so we, what we want to see is whether the use of this information will differ based on patient race, given some of the rates um, of, of disease for some of these different diseases based on race, sort of how they use race and genetics and try to suss all of this out. It's a very exploratory study, but we're collecting data right now, and we'll be really excited to see how this pans out. Remember, the risk level is way higher. So that was uh, not exactly what we expected to 
to see, but luckily we had also measured uh, how guilty we were making this parent feel. So we looked at how guilty the parents felt about sort of passing down genetic risk and also about the feeding of the child. Um, I'm only showing the genetic guilt here, but they're, they looked roughly similar. Um, and we were finding that we we're making this one parent group feel really, really guilty. Because, right, you can't diffuse the, you can't diffuse the blame with the other parent. It's really it's you. You're increasing your child's risk. You know, that's, that's it. So the one thing we couldn't do is we couldn't look and see whether this was a mediating variable. One of the things we were thinking was well, maybe, you know, we're giving information, we're making the parents feel guilty, they're going into the buffet, trying to assuage their guilt, and that's actually what's changing their feeding behavior. That's our mechanism. Um, we weren't able to do that. What we did see on that study was that feeding a healthier meal from the virtual buffet did reduce guilt at post -act. So they were able to kind of feel less guilty by choosing healthy food. But we don't know if it was the guilt that sort of caused the changes in feeding. So that was sort of the what's next. Well, you know, let's test that pathway because you know, what if it is actually this affective mechanism that we really think about, like, well, we don't want to make parents feel guilty, like, that's negative affect, that's terrible. But what if it changes behavior, then how would we want to think about that? That would be a thorny problem, but it would be good to know. Um, so we decided to sort of go and have that be our next step. So could we, so giving the genomic risk information leads to guilt, leads to behavior change, which would then reduce the guilt. Um, so we started designing studies to kind of think about how to do that. The other thing we wanted to do is, like, okay, we're giving this family history-based risk information, but I just pulled up one of the sort of um, conceptual pathways of obesity risk. <laughs> I mean, and as you all know, they look like this, right? So how can we move from just saying, like, yes or no family history to something a little bit more, can we just sort of start to talk about this in a little bit more holistic way and think about you know, gene environment interaction and how this might actually be playing out? Uh, so how can we start to kind of think about that? Oh, and I added that little guy over there to remind myself that the first study we did was all moms, which is where most of this literature is. Most of it is all about the mother, but we were all looking really, like, come on, you know, it's the 2000s, like we really need to get dads in there. So we also started to uh, attempt to recruit dads for some of this research to look at, um, you know, if they would look the same as moms or different or how that would all play out. So the first thing we did is start designing our messages. So then we said, okay, well, let's see, you know, let's, let's look at how things are happening right now. So right now, how are parents getting this information? They're getting it from the media. So we took some existing media articles and things, and we decided, well, let's make an article, uh, a bunch of media articles that, that talk about these different causal factors in obesity. So we had genetics, or an article that really focused on genetics, one that really focused on the family home environment, uh, one that was a gene by family environment interaction article, and our control article, which was on, like, DC diving. We also wanted to look at it by child weight status, because as we know, you know, children who are already overweight in young life are at much higher risk later on, and because this was sort of our test of our stimuli, we did it online. We went ahead and we collected parents online and just looked at their cognitive and emotional responses to these messages. So when we did that, we found something we were not expecting to see, which is kind of the theme of this talk, really, um, which is that those parents, so this is showing risk perception for the child and guilt for the child around the child's weight. The set of bars on the left are those parents whose children are lean, and those on the right are parents who report that their child is at the present time overweight. So what we found was that giving that gene by oh, and I don't have a key to the condition, I see. So that's where we're oh oh no, what did I do? want to 
to do. Because um, ideally, we would talk about both genetics and behavior um, all together and kind of explain how this actually works. So when we went to go to the lab study, we said, okay, let's switch. Let's not do it in the media, because the media is so easy to discount, especially these days. Let's go back to a health education message kind of framework and do, you know, boring PowerPoint public health -y kind of um, risk messaging. So we pre-tested those. They looked more like we expected. Um, and so we did a lab study looking with these, at these four groups, once again. Um, we looked at emotion and cognition. Guilt was one of the big ones we looked at here. We put our parents in our virtual buffet, and we tested their uh, behavior. We looked again, did the use of the buffet, switched the guilt, and then finally we did a one-week follow-up where we came back to parents one week later, and we said, okay, how do you feel? What have you fed the kid in the last week? Uh, food frequency questionnaires, you know, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So the next thing I'm going to tell you is super preliminary. We just had the data on this. So I'm going to show you preliminary data. I don't think it's going to change, but there's going to be more. I'm not going to be able to tell you the whole story. So first thing we do is look at the calories selected in the VR buffet. And basically what we found is actually from a gender difference, which was kind of interesting. Um, and we found that our mothers here on the left selected more calories in the buffet when they got information about genetics. So when those mothers heard about genetics, we're starting to see some of this defensive news creep out. Or not defensive, I'm sorry, deterministic um, kind of behavior creep out, which is kind of interesting because you know, this was a, a fear people had a long time ago, and then you know, for many years people, oh no, that doesn't happen, people aren't deterministic, we shouldn't worry about it. But uh, now we're starting to kind of see little, little echoes of it, which is interesting because our messages were not deterministic. <laughs> But we're only seeing it among mothers. Then we looked at our food frequency questionnaires. Uh, we gave, we looked at, I think, five different categories of sort of unhealthy foods. Three of them, there were no differences. On two of them, we saw the same difference, which again, was those parents who got the genes only message, again, are reporting serving higher levels of those sort of junk food categories, which is kind of interesting. So then we went on to go ahead and look at guilt. Um, so here, what we're seeing for both mothers and fathers is that the family environment alone message is really amping up the guilt. Um, and that's really, this is general guilt. This isn't sort of guilt about any one thing. This is us asking parents, oh, after you read this message, you know, how much do you feel all of these different adjectives? So those parents who have gotten the family environment only message were really kind of feeling the guilt. Um, this interaction is not significant between mothers and fathers. You know, that's not a, so really across the board for mothers and fathers, it's that family environment only message. So then the next question is, okay, well, is that guilt driving anything? You would think no based on the pattern of results, and you would be right. So guilt is not a mediator here for us, which, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of good. It's a, it's a thing we don't have to grapple with. We don't have to figure out, you know, should we make parents, parents feel terrible to help, you know, increase their, their healthy behaviors? Um, so what we're seeing for now is that gene by family environment is probably the way to go. Because by putting these two messages together, you don't get the negative behavioral um, outcomes of having that genetic message alone, and you don't get the negative affect of having that family environment message alone. So probably putting them together is the way to go, which is what we would hope because it's reality, and we really like to teach people things that are real and true um, and more accurate. So, so far this is looking good and interesting, but there's a ton more to do on this particular data set just come in. Okay, so now where are we going? So we're going to look at those data, but where do we go with this? We, we started to think about, well, like maybe we know enough stuff now that we should start to develop some actual, like, we keep saying we're trying to optimize the way we communicate, and so sort of like, well, maybe we should actually, you know, do that. We should try to communicate. So one thing we're working on right now is trying to build a virtual reality tool to help us communicate some of these it looks like gene environment interaction is going to be a good thing to talk about with people in this context of genomics and of health behavior and obesity. Um, but it's hard. It's a hard concept. And it's one we've not had a lot of luck with in the past. So we said, okay, well, let's take all the power of virtual reality and see if we can use that to try to communicate gene environment interaction. And so that's something we're working on right now, not done. Um, so if anyone has any brilliant thoughts, let me know. But basically, we're developing and then evaluating a virtual reality-based tool, it's a very experiential tool, to try and communicate the concept of gene-environment interaction, and we're doing this here related to eating behavior. So the idea is to make it embodied. So we're going to try to couple people from their own experience, which is kind of a weird thing to say. But basically, you know, people tend to think that everyone, you know, my red is your red, 
you know, my reaction around cookies is your reaction around cookies. If you eat one and I don't, it's because I have more willpower, right? But there are actually lots of differences in the way people respond to palatable food in their environment, the way people respond to smell, the way, you know, people respond to everything. So trying to kind of teach this, and some of this is genetically driven. Okay, there's still a lot of work to be done, but there are lots of genes that influence eating. So the idea is to try to put people in the perspective of another person, this kind of first-person perspective piece I talked about, and say, okay, now you are Jimmy. Okay, let's see, let me see the world through as Jimmy sees the world, and try to teach them about how genetics um, can influence eating behavior, and how that plays out in different kinds of environments, and how that relates to health outcomes down the road over time. So I'm going to give you an example. So I just going to put people as Jimmy. I just made up Jimmy, that's not really what we're going to call them. But we're going to put them into these little vignettes. So here is this idea of having sort of health. You know, you're in your office, somebody comes by and they're like, oh my God, could you use the break room? And they're so good. You know, and some people are like, okay, maybe I'll have one after lunch. And other people are just like, there's cookies in the break room. There's cookies in the break room. I'm going to work. Okay, no, no, we're going to work. So there's cookies in the break room. Right? So you know which of those people you are. And it's all along the spectrum, there's different, different reactions. Right? But we can show people this by putting them in a virtual reality office environment and having a virtual cookie that either gets in the way of your task, which is always kind of creeping into your files that you're trying to sort and getting in the way, or not. Right? And so trying to kind of use metaphor to kind of show that for some people, that cookie, you cannot ignore it. Okay? That palatable food in the environment is lighting up all these brain areas that are not going to allow you to concentrate on what you've got going on. Right? So the idea is to kind of show these kind of reactions and how they differ among people, but then also how they differ in different environments. So if you have an office where everyone was great, well, let's only bring in cookies on Friday. You know, we're going to limit it. Or an office, like I've heard some offices, my office is not this way, I was like, let's just bring in crudite. Let's not do this, right? <laughs> um, and then see how those different environments lead to differences in weight gain and to health behavior and, you know, how can we sort of toggle these environments for the best outcomes? And then in terms of the outcomes we want to look at after exposure to this kind of experiential environment, we're going to look at comprehension, the message, first and foremost, because that's kind of what we're trying to teach. We can look at health behavior motivation. And then for some audiences, I think this might be an important tool for, for stigma reduction and empathy. Because, again, people don't realize that other people experience the world in different ways. And they just think that their you know, their willpower is like the best. So that is a broad overview of how uh, the work that I do is using virtual reality to help us kind of push forward, envision, optimize ways to communicate about these complicated concepts um, for common disease. Because, you know, it's looking like common disease information around genomics is going to be influential, um, but it's, not, it's really not easy to figure this out. So even though we're not using it in clinic, it's time to start today to figure out how we should actually be talking about these things and how we should be and so I will just end by acknowledging all the people who have helped to make this work uh, a reality, including all of my current lab members and lab alumni and my collaborators. And I am happy to give plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Have you looked at the situation where the information about obesity is presented by a heavy set doctor versus a speed doctor versus a yeah. looks like an Olympian kind of doctor? Yeah. So we have. Um, and I didn't say that. Right now we've only done it online. We've not done it in a VR setting. Um, and what we are, whoa, sorry, phone call. I don't need to get that. Um, what we are seeing is that the, um, the sort of negative reaction to the heavy set doctor is swamping everything. It doesn't matter if that doctor is presenting genetic information, behavioral information. They just don't like getting anything about weight from a doctor who's heavy. Um, and so that's kind of what we're seeing right now. Um, so it's kind of hard to see how that, you know, so that might just be the reaction that we're going to see across the board. But um, I would imagine that people would react more negatively to most messages in that domain. Do you think gender's a factor at all with the doctor presenting yeah. information, whether overweight or not? Mm -hmm. So we, I do think gender will be a factor. So in the work that I was just talking about, we use female providers. Um, just because that's where we see the most weight stigma. We thought that would be sort of an interesting place to start. Um, and I was kind of saying that, you know, our Dr. Morrison, where we ended up, was a process. Um, and that's because some of the early work we were doing was actually around um, 
the communication style that the provider used and how that influenced the receipt of the genomic information. So do people react better to genetic information if it's sort of a patient-centered kind of wrapper? Um, but when we pre-tested our doctor, we couldn't get anybody to believe that our female virtual doctor was sort of more um, directed and paternalistic doctor, like the more, more doctor than a doctor. So <laughs> it's okay, you know, so we kind of tried every which way, and they were like, no, no, women doctors don't do that. I'm like, oh, stereotype. <laughs> um, so we just ended up going with a male doctor for a lot of the work that we've done in this area, but I absolutely do, for these reasons, think that it will definitely make a difference, and that's a, a study yet to be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you determine the comprehension or the, um, or the message? Because there's a lot of different yeah, share with genetic information mm -hmm. that might not necessarily make one have any of those functional responses. Yeah, so between the comprehension, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, in the study that I talked about where we're going to measure comprehension, we haven't done it yet, but we actually did do a study on this that didn't present really early on a complete failed attempt to teach the environment interaction with virtual reality. It's a whole different kind of metaphor. Um, and there we measured it using. Um, just sort of fast learning and transfer, so if you give them another situation, can they take what they learned and sort of transfer it to a new gene environment context? Um, and then we also, there was one more kind of comprehension we measure, but I can't think of it off yet. But we used to kind of gather it in three different ways. Uh, but mostly we're interested to see if they can take it in, into a new context and sort of use it to understand gene environment interaction in a more sort of global way. At this point, are the children that you're referring to well and healthy in the minds of the parents, or are they ill children? Well and healthy, almost entirely. We actually, in a lot of our studies, screen out children with any major um, health disorders that would, would impact eating or feeding, um, because we're really this is kind of a public health focused project. Do you have any questions? Yeah, how much of an effect the fear that participants might bring will affect their interaction? We were talking a little bit about it before, that, that, and I wonder how much you try to understand what the participants, before they even engage in the virtual reality exercise, where they're starting, where they're, they're starting in their own uh, state. Is it state or is it trait, yeah. uh, this fear? Because yeah. there's yeah. so much interaction between mm -hmm. nutrition and mental state. Mm -hmm. And that one of the most intriguing studies is recently from Australia was taking people who scored depressive by CSD objective criteria and then were randomized to Mediterranean diet or their standard Australian diet, just like standard American diet, we call SAD. Mm -hmm. And and they were the, the, the participation was validated objectively with you know carotenoid through the skin and then blinded. Um, investigators reassessed depression and it was alleviated in three weeks mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean diet. So that's depression, not fear, but the point is that what we consider state is maybe yeah. modifiable. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder yeah. how much that affects all of this. Mm -hmm. so, so what we did in these studies was we did, we, we did what we call the incidental emotion. So basically we, we influenced emotion. It was experimental. So we actually did it with movie clips. Uh, we made them walk the plank. <laughs> right. Yeah. So actually, that's something else we're working on is using VR because we think it'll be more effective. But we had them watch clips from, you know, Silence of the Lambs versus, uh, you know, like little clips. So these are validated um, emotion injections that you can use. But the reason we do that is to kind of do it outside of the context is because we think all of these sources of fear will operate kind of in similar ways. Um, I mean, if they're very integral to the um, interaction, that might have an, added, an extra added layer, but really, you know, fear physiologically in the body is fear. And so it might be, you know, something coming from traits. It might be state. Yeah. But this is kind of what we can expect when you have somebody in a sort of an acute. Either way, there's a huge yeah. effect on yeah. how they're going to interact. That sort of metabolic mindset, something the provider needs to know mm -hmm. to counsel mm -hmm. properly so it's not to lose, disengage people. So can you extend that to say that fear leads to fact resistance? I mean, that kind of... Yeah, so I, I, I haven't done that work, but yeah, people have definitely done that work. Um, that when you're in a fear state, you're sort of in an avoidance. You're, um, it's an avoid emotion. It's a um, high 
with perception emotion, and it does, you're, it is more likely to lead to this kind of disengagement of this, like, I don't want to see any of this, I don't want anything to do with any of this, I'm going to, like, I'm going to stay in my bubble. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I think that that, that literature is, would say that. Uh, I'm curious to know what um, your use of the virtual environment in terms of eating behavior, how um, accurate is that in comparison to a real world um, buffet? So I'm familiar with the real world buffet, and I thought of using a VR buffet would be mm -hmm. very useful mm -hmm. as a research dietitian. Um, but do you have any info about that? So, we did do um, a small validation of VR buffet. And we worked with our metabolic kitchen at the National Center. Um, so we did the sort of actual food serving piece, which is a single food, so rotini with tomato sauce. Um, and we assessed servings of the virtual food that they took versus servings of the real world pasta that was made to be as similar as possible. Um, Countervailance order, we made them some textures in between to kind of clear their visual memory buffers. Uh, and we found a really quite good correlation. So we're not able to say that if they choose you know, 300 calories of pasta in the virtual, they will choose 300 calories of pasta in the real. But we are able to say, which is what we mostly want to say, is that those who are the low servers in reality will be the low servers in virtual and vice versa. And so that's what we saw there. We've also looked at servings of um, the full buffet and seen some of the patterns we want to see, like more calories to older children. Um, parents are reasonably good judges of whether they're serving kind of high calorie or low calorie meals in the buffet. And then um, I have a colleague at UMBC who I've been consulting with them. They built a virtual um, a big virtual version of their dining hall, which is very cool. So this, you know, the foods aren't exactly the same because dining hall varies every day. But then they, they did a study where they sort of turned them loose in the virtual buffet and in the dining hall. Um, and it also seemed very good correlation calorie content, under nutrient content, and what's chosen. So that's kind of where the evidence is at present. So in some ways, it's where, what you want to use it for. Mm -hmm. So for us, when we look at an intervention, it's really differences between groups, it performs really well. But it's sort of, you know, if you want to be able to say they're going to choose 200 calories, it's, uh, eh, I don't know. So can you vary the placement of the stations in the virtual book? Because, like, in our cafeteria, our real cafeteria here, all the greasy nests is up in the yeah. front, yeah. and the salad <laughs> bar is all the way in the back. <laughs> But I was expecting yeah. that yeah. people are going to want to go to the kitchen to get to the kitchen. Yeah, MCH studies that extensively. Yeah, yeah. Our cafeteria, we don't own, they own their cafeteria. We contract. It makes all the difference. So they're profitable. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. right. It's 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 but we do find that in the first, it, it can be done, certainly. Uh, it's not something that's built into the system to do very easily, but it's something that absolutely can be done. Um, and what we did find is that where the foods are in the environment is very influential. Because a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people do kind of go down. You know, make individuals like, this food, yes, no, this food, yes, no, this food, yes, no. Where the other people kind of look around and be like, okay, that went out and that one, right? And then go over to those places. So we've done some work looking at how people actually engage with the thing. And have that food ordering to be a really important way that they, they do engage. Um, and, we, and it's absolutely possible to do that or experimentally. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm, just, I'm sure someone has done this study, but for people who get a new diagnosis, mm -hmm. most often you'll hear that they radically change their diet, that the patient begins to eat things that they might. So it would seem to me that here with hormones with a high likelihood for behavior change when they're examining their um, meat, which is kind of counter to what you're saying is when they're given um, genetic information about Yeah. But I think the important piece here is efficacy, responsibility of the thing. Right? So genetics you're getting information that you might interpret as like I can't do anything about this. Like why would I want to make myself Right, where in this cancer example, you have someone that, well, you know, there's nutritional avenues here, um, so that might make a difference. Yeah. But it's fear is the motivator. Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah. So it's really interesting to see all the impact on food choice. But I wonder if you've gone a little further to look at behavior and interaction with kids during meal time as well. Right. So it's one thing to get all the right, you know, healthy options 
the jam. But then what happens when you sit down and your kids refuse to eat it or they want more? Like, do you, how do you make decisions about quantity beyond that? Yeah. Yeah, those are really important questions. And we really can't tell very much from them. Um, the few things that we can do, we've done, which is that how much is meal that you've chosen, so you can actually eat. You know, have you chosen items that your child would eat? What items would they? What else would they? And by and large, parents report to the things that their kids would eat, and they think their kids would eat most of what's on that plate. Um, but not all of it, definitely not all of it. And you know, we can have a guess about which part they probably wouldn't eat. Um, but for now, all this allows them to do is actually look at like, the choices of creating the plate, but not what happens you know, after that plate. Important work has to be done. <laughs> yeah, Any thoughts on what might happen if you had your people? Eating all the cookies they want in VR and then having a plate of cookies put in front of them. Are they going to eat more? That's already been done. With Jonah. Let's go. So, <laughs> yeah. So, a colleague of mine at Stanford did a study where they had virtual donuts. And they actually varied whether there was a physical donut model and whether they smelled vanilla while they were doing this. Um, and I don't remember exactly which condition was the best. I think it was E. You could either have a vanilla or a smell, and having both didn't help that much. But if you eat a bunch of a virtual donuts, and then you're given a donut to get some later, uh, then you eat less donuts. Uh, if you're given the opportunity, that's the feeling. Um, which I would have expected maybe to be the opposite, I'm not sure. Uh, but that's so far the one study that's been done. So, so that kind of goes flip to the, so the game, uh, you know, shoot them up in a first person shooter game where concerns are always, you know, more shooting than means sensitization. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting case. So I actually did my dissertation on that.